Welcome to the 27th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium sponsored by Pfizer, AFA, and UConn. We are grateful for our sponsors' generous support. Hi, I'm Deepak Bay, UConn Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Statistics. Thank you for joining us today. I am honored to welcome you and provide an orientation for you. My colleague, Dr. Yu Ping Zhang, will guide us through the later portion of this program, and you will see her later. Today, we are here to celebrate the distinguished career of Dr. Mary W. Gray, distinguished professor of mathematics and statistics at American University, will be joined later also by Dr. Nancy Flournoy, Professor Emerita from University of Missouri, the Director and Dr. Nawar Shara, the Director of the Department of Biostatistics and Biomedical Informatics and Associate Professor of Medicine from Georgetown University. Before we go on, let's go over some key elements that will enhance your viewing experience. We are recording today's event and you will be able to access 24 hours from now using the same link used to log in today. Take a look at the tabs on the platform, program tab with our agenda, live chat, questions, polling, and resources. Let's try the chat feature right now. Type in where you are joining us from and how many of these colloquiums you have attended. I would type in stores and various other places. During the question and answer portion of our program, please submit your questions using the questions tab on the left next to the program agenda tab. We will compile your questions for our interviewers to ask during the interview portion. One lucky question asker will win a commemorative item from this colloquium and the winner will be notified tomorrow via email. But first, let's have a little Professor Gray trivia. Shortly, you will see a poll question pop up on your screen. What was the little title of Mary W. Gray's PhD dissertation? A radical subcategories, B, a radical approach to algebra, C, power of test procedures for certain incompletely specified random and mixed models, D, objective Bayesian estimation for the number of classes in a population using Jeffries or reference priors. Let us know what you think the answer is, and we look forward to sharing the results after the keynote address. And now we'll begin our presentation. Hello everyone, I'm Rick Vitale. As a recent retiree from the Department of Statistics at UConn, I'm grateful to Deepak for the opportunity to participate in this edition of the Pfizer Colloquium Series. In that capacity, I have the distinct honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Mary W. Gray. Dr. Gray holds the rank of Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Statistics at American University. As both a statistician and a lawyer, she has dedicated herself both to 
education, and to ameliorating the wrongs of society. That is, to use statistics in Mary's own words to improve situations for people. In the 1960s, while Mary was earning her PhD at the University of Kansas, she became keenly aware that women with advanced degrees in mathematics often faced job discrimination. It was not long after that that Mary founded the Association for Women in Mathematics and served as its first president. It's now 50 years later, the AWM continues its important work and Mary's extraordinary career has displayed a broad and creative combination of scholarship and teaching, advocacy and leadership. She is the author of two books and more than 80 articles and has given countless presentations, including to international audiences and in testimony before Congress on such topics as affirmative action, income tax reform, pay equity, and women in science. Besides the AWM, Mary has held membership and leadership status in many different organizations. To name but one more, she has been a member of Amnesty International USA for more than 25 years, including serving as its international treasurer. Over the years, Mary's work has been recognized with a variety of awards. In 1979, she was recognized with the Georgina Smith Award by the American Association of University Professors for her work on the status of women in collective bargaining. For her highly effective mentoring of young colleagues, Mary was recognized in 1994 by the American Association for the Advancement of Science with its Mentor Award for Lifetime Achievement. And in 2001, she received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Engineering, and Mathematics Mentoring. More recently, Mary was recognized in 2017 by the ASA with the Carl E. Peace Award for Outstanding Statistical Contributions for the Betterment of Society. And now it is indeed an honor to present Mary, who will share with us her thoughts on statistics and human rights. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm very, very pleased to be here. I'm going to tell you about some of my experience and hope that I can engage you in some of the activities that I'm going to discuss. So as we know, this is the 27th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium. I'd like to thank its sponsors, the University of Connecticut, the American Statistical Association, and Pfizer. I like to think that statistics can open the world. In my very first job, I was asked to pour tea, not in order to carry out the well-known Fisher inspiration for experimental design, but in response to the request from the department chair that we always ask ladies to pour tea. I started out my, my career by saying, let's have a gentleman do it this time. It's probably not the best way to start out, but I decided when I, later on when I wanted to be promoted to associate professor, the department chair had removed all of my publications from my file before sending it forward. Maybe because of the not pouring tea, maybe because I also declined to make curtains for the faculty lounge, or maybe because I objected to having my phone tap. But that may be because I was a union activist 
In any case, I guess I was a troublemaker, but we got the president of the university fired and I got promoted. So this was a big improvement over being told when I first started graduate school that I shouldn't be taking the place of a man. It wasn't Kansas anymore. Kansas is where I got my degree. As, as, as Alice said, it's not Kansas anymore. My first serious human rights work resulted from my working to deliver supplies to the Central Valley farm workers because I served on the Alameda County, California um, Union Council. So fortunately, my father had taught me how to drive a truck. They were short of truck drivers because the drivers of trucks don't belong to the same union. So I knew how to drive a truck instead of pouring tea. I really drank coffee in Nebraska anyway, and I learned a lot about organizing, but it was a long time before I could eat grapes again. I've often been asked whether it's different now. My students in the class just last night asked me that. Um, colleagues and others don't say they expect me to pour the tea. They learn better than that, and some of them probably still think it. Uh, it's certainly the case that first jobs are easier for women to get, but the glass ceiling is only cracked. It hasn't disappeared. There's still gender bias along the way. For example, in academe, the student evaluations of teaching, which administrators love, are well known to have bias. And in addition to that, of course, they rely on finding the mean of categorical variables the day after we tell students not to do that. Many jobs in academe have changed, however, even before the, pack, the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, in the guise of trying to improve teaching, vast numbers of non-tenured positions have become available at lower pay, less security, and of course, they're more proportionately filled by women. In my own department, 50% of the tenure and tenure track people who are term faculty, in other words, non-tenured, are women, but only 27% of the tenured and tenure track are women. And actually we're doing pretty well compared to some, some institutions. The idea that we separate research and teaching um, has become to be a strange one that I think damages both. It seems to me that researchers ought to bring their insights to teaching and teachers ought to engage in research. Um, in the interest of reduced teaching loads, the job of instructor has been um, replaced with the use of so-called instructional designers. Um, people who don't even know how to do a t-test are now designing how we teach logistic regression. And the advisors who equally lack knowledge are telling students who come in with two semesters of calculus that maybe they should start in calculus one because it might be easier. Now computing power, on the other hand, is on our desks or in our hands or on our watches. It's not in the man, massive mainframe where you had to trek across the campus, turn in your program, wait, come back, pick out the results, which turned out not to be correct, and start all over again. When I started, we used decks of cards, and if along the way across campus, you happened to drop the deck, drop the deck of cards, a week's work was gone. One thing, however, that I do long for is the battery life of the BlackBerry. Every time Apple comes out with a new one, I keep hoping it'll have the same power. Of course, the BlackBerry was a phone. It wasn't trying to do everything else in the world. Uh, whatever the language du jour, of course, today it's, it's R, although Python is certainly creeping up on R. Uh, look what, hap what happened to some other languages. COBOL, which of course was associated with a woman, um, Fortran, Ada, which has a feminine name, which maybe is what sunk it, uh, whatever the language, whatever supplies the power, whether it's a big machine or whether it's your watch, um, perhaps artificial intelligence and machine learning might open up new vistas. But unfortunately, they haven't opened up new vistas. They've opened up the same vistas wider. And we still have garbage in, garbage out. And I've written on the subject, a lot of people have written on the subject of all of the bias that results from making decisions on things like sentencing and parole and similar very important topics. Um, and the same bias is there. Um, for four years, the four years I was in Berkeley, there was plenty of activity there, although it didn't seem to me the sun ever came up until noon. There was a Black Panthers event in the streets, which was a little scary, but they had a good breakfast program for the kids. The meetings looked like the one on the right. It was mainly white men and I wanted them to look more like the one on the left, where there are all sorts of genders and all sorts of colors appearing. 
Um, also, when I got to be on the council, then finally the vice president of the American Mathematical Society, um, and introduced the notion that we should have double blind refereeing in mathematics, uh, one of the other members of the council asked, how would we know whether a paper was any good if we didn't know who wrote it? Well, that sort of expressed what they thought about um, lack of bias and what they thought of the old boy network. So I decided to found, found the Association for Women in Mathematics 50 years ago. And then later I joined up with the Caucus for Women in Statistics. Why did I switch from an emphasis of mathematics uh, to an emphasis in statistics? And I don't want to argue about whether statistics is a subset of mathematics or the other way around. But I did decide that it took 300 years to prove Fermat's last theorem, and you still couldn't see a big impact on the world um, from that theorem. So it seemed to me that statistics had some potential for saving the world. But I saw an exhibit of Justice Ginsburg at the New York Historical Society just over the weekend, and I noticed the quotation of hers that, I, that I've always liked. Fight for the things that you think about, but in a way that will lead others to join you. And that's, I think, what has made the progress in, in women in science, women in mathematics, women in statistics, as good as it is. And we've decided to join together, and we've all tried to work for the same sort of thing. But before taking on the world, I discovered that sometimes social justice begins at home. So I got an announcement about the, my retirement benefits, which would accrue from my work, only to learn that at retirement, a man the same age with the same accumulation of funds in his retirement account would get 15% more per month than I. Uh, to my indignant complaint to the insurance company about discrimination in employment in employee benefits being illegal, the agent asserted that this was not discrimination on the basis of sex, but rather on the basis of longevity. So then I asked for a guarantee of longer life. So he accused me of just not understanding statistics. But I worked very hard with uh, attorneys who were handling the case, putting together data to back up uh, the notion that in fact what they were doing was discriminatory. Then the insurance company accused me of not understanding the law. So I fixed that one by going to law school. And we won, we won. Uh, it takes so long, <laughs> excuse me, it takes so long for things to get to the courts that by the time that the case uh, involving discrimina discrimination in employment retirement uh, got to the Supreme Court, I could write a brief as a member of the Supreme Court bar. But I happened to be on a th in a theater in London uh, when the, the decision came in the, in the middle of the summer, and I turned out that we, it turned out that we had won. So the Supreme Court had taken our view that discrimination on the basis of gender and retirement plans was illegal. Um, now, you, again, you might not think that equality and pension benefits is a human right, but for a lot of women who had taught for years at lower pay when they had been teaching, and then at even discriminatorily lower pensions when they retired and made a big difference. Uh, women told us that now they could afford to have a telephone in their house. Now they could afford to eat something other than cat food. So equality and pension benefits was important to a lot of people. Some people don't even think that having a job is a human right, uh, although it is so characterized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In case you're wondering who's on the left, that's Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my great heroines. Universal Declaration of Human Rights deals with matters such as um, education, food, housing, healthcare, employment, all topics not covered by the U.S. Bill of Rights. And I have to admit that victory for social justice that I've just described in pension was particularly pleasant, not only because of the statistics, but because it was to my benefit as well, even though I don't anticipate retiring anytime soon. Why don't I retire, you might ask? Well, maybe I would, did I not love my job so much. Although I do admit, I wish I were paid as much as equally qualified men are paid, but I don't have to retire, which is another triumph for statistics. I was a member of a National Academy of Sciences commission to make a recommendation to Congress of whether uh, there should be continued to be mandatory retirement for tenured professors. A few years previously, mandatory retirement had been abolished, abolished for most people 
except for airline pilots, uh, firemen, and tenured professors. So this was to consider what should be done about those of us who were tenured. Fortunately, we backed up lots of statistics showing um, how beneficial uh, people were at various ages and how unfair it would be to have mandatory retirement only for one class of, of people and how that would harm education and be bad for society and all of the good arguments that you always make to Congress and sometimes even Congress agrees. So as a result, no mandatory retirement and I'm still around and still fighting for rights at home. And this is a message for um, particularly those of you who are expense, at expensive private universities like American University, or for any place where a lot of the jobs of your employer are outsourced out. So for example, the people who do the cleaning and the dining services at my university are not actually university employees. It's outsourced to, to different companies who handle this. We have pretty good uh, employment benefits at American, in addition to a decent uh, retirement plan, since I got it fixed. Uh, we also get free tuition. Uh, we get free tuition for our children, free, free tuition for our domestic partners. Uh, we get a decent health care plan. On the other hand, the outsourced workers don't get any of the university benefits. Uh, they now do have some health benefits through their unions, but the university hasn't done much for them. It's been a long battle, but over the last about uh, a dozen years, uh, I've managed to work with the union people from the unions, from the employers, employees themselves, and some faculty members, so that we now have free tuition for the children of the workers. And we're always worried about diversity of the student body, and there's little that you can do to improve it more than looking at the children of the outsourced employees at a lot of different places. So we also need some, some help to prepare some of the students to be admitted, but we have got the free tuition. We haven't managed the free tuition for the workers. It was thought for uh, some of the administrators for a while, what maybe we could give them in tuition in very low level courses, like um, some low level algebra course or uh, some low-level writing course or something. <clears throat> and this was until one of the cooks said, well, you know, I'd like to sign up for a course in management because my five barber shops need to be expanded and I could use some management training. So that at least ended the talk about keeping the employees only in low-level classes, but we've still managed only that they can audit the courses, not that they can get credit. So as I say, if you're looking for some place to, um, to do some social justice, it may be right at your own university, or if you're in a large employer, it may be uh, with your outsourced workers. Okay, so statistics and human rights. Statistics, I think we all know, but what do we mean by human rights? Some focus, as I've said, on the basic necessities of life, like safety and food. Uh, others think of human rights as more amorphous. Uh, some of people think they're desirable for some people, maybe not so desirable for everybody. Um, I should mention, for example, that the president of one scientific society, not statistics, when, I, when asked somewhat skeptically why he had added a person to the Committee on Human Rights that I chaired, said, well, we have to have someone against human rights as well as for human rights on the committee. Well, maybe things will get better. In the United States, Many of us tend to identify human rights more as civil rights as those rights whose protection, whose protection is enshrined in, the, enshrined in the Constitution. Of course, most people aren't too sure what they are. What is it that's being protected? From the First Amendment come freedom from the establishment of religion and freedom of speech, the press and assembly. From the second, the right to keep and bear arms not clear whether that applies to automatic weapons and machine guns and what have you. Uh, the third through the eighth amendments protect those rights that we usually think of in a criminal justice context. Uh, freedom from unsearch unreasonable search and seizure, from self-incrimination, as well as the uh, right to a trial with an impartial jury, the right to counsel, uh, free from cruel and unusual punishment. Now in the protection of most of these, Statistics really plays an important role. What does the Bill of Rights mean? Well, 
Does the First Amendment mean we can put anything we want, even the pseudoscience that we see on, on Facebook? Uh, does the second mean that I can come into class with a gun in my belt to ensure appropriate attention and deference from my students, including keeping their masks on? Or of more concern at the moment, can some student or colleague wave around a, lo a loaded gun to express her or his displeasure with the mask requirement? or with the fact that other people aren't wearing them, or with the way I'm teaching statistics. This constitutional protection of persons, powers, papers, and effects extend to phone calls. Many view the Constitution as a bulwark of protection, no doubt, but many of us also see it currently under threat from a number of directions. Constitution isn't everything. There are additional rights which are guaranteed by other amendments beyond the Bill of Rights. In particular, the post-Civil War amendments guaranteeing certain rights. The 13th Amendment, the right not to be enslaved. The 14th, the right of equal protection. Well, equal except not for women, not until we get the ERA adopted, which may not be in my lifetime. And the 15th and 19th right to vote amendments took a while longer for women to get it. That's why it's the 19th for women. We use statistics to verify the, um, the fairness in elections, to be sure that the results of elections are reported correctly, uh, to be sure that the, thing, that the elections were administered fair, fairly, and also to determine representation issues, which are really important given the results of the, uh, two tw the 2020 census. One of the projects done by my students, of which I'm especially proud, evaluated the effect of ID requirements on voter participation in Virginia. Uh, it turned out that overwhelmingly, those, those attempting to vote and who were turned away for lack of ID were low income and or minority voters. Um, now, the, the ID, requ ID requirements were subsequently loosened, but whatever ID requirements there are, it doesn't address the issue of those potential voters who don't show up at the polls to exercise a right to vote, knowing or fearing that they're going to be turned away. So the next year after we did the um, exit polls to ask people if they'd been turned away, we went out into the community to try to find out how widespread the knowledge of the ID requirements were and what could be done to make it easier for some of them to be met. Uh, what you see on the right hand is the gerrymandered district, uh, the redistricting, redistricting which is going on now in almost every state comes up with features like this. That's one of the side effects of statistics that, like I say, for better or for worse, can be used to guarantee the accessibility or to deny the accessibility of voting to everyone. <coughs> Some rights jump out in needing statistical evidence. Is the death penalty cruel and unusual? How would we know if we didn't have any statistics? What does speedy trial mean? How do we determine that a jury was impartially selected? What's the effect of bearing arms if it means keeping loaded guns in unlocked drawers when there are children in the house? <coughs> Only recently has the CDCP employed statistics in aid of reducing gun violence. And fundamentally, with rights, what is equal in the protection of the laws. Beyond the rights conferred by the Constitution, there are those rights that Congress has legislated and promised to protect. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 deals with equal rights in employment, education, housing, and public accommodation, while Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1972 banned discrimination on the basis of sex in education. <laughs> Complications in the protection of human rights arise from the court's recognition of two types of discrimination. There's disparate, disparate treatment. If you were told you just didn't get the job because they didn't want a woman, that's disparate treatment. Disparate impact means that there's some requirement that while neutral on its face has an adverse impact on a protected category. For example, height can be a, um, a restricted uh, neutral, and apparently neutral requirement. And if it had been in effect, I wouldn't have had a woman pilot on my last flight into Washington. The seminal case involved a lineman in North Carolina 
Uh, the requirement was used of high school diplomas was used to exclude black men. Nobody ever thought of women being line persons. And statistics, statisticians showed that the requirement had a disparate impact uh, on black men in North Carolina. And it wasn't required because for years, white men had been putting up lines without high school diplomas. More relevant to some of us is a recent pay case of university faculty where the question was whether we're basing, basing salaries in part on outside offers, so-called retention raises, had led to an adverse impact on women and should subsequently be found illegal. This is under litigation in several cases. Um, we don't know what the result will eventually be. Unfortunately, it's probably going to end up in the Supreme Court. A recent New York Times article told of a local installation of a major U.S. company that gave uh, five employees retention raises of $1.50 an hour without specifying on what this was based. Uh, now, I think since the Nobel Prize that recently came out in economics, the idea of establishing higher minimum wage laws is actually economically a boon. That should be a help to everyone. The Supreme Court way back in 1954, said that on the basis of um, race, separate can never be equal. Uh, particularly the case was in education, but applies more generally. There's a less restrictive gender discrimination standard, uh, but gender discrimination has been found unconstitution, unconstitutional. In particular, the Supreme Court declared that uh, the Virginia Military Institute's leadership courses, which were close to women, were um, discriminatory because the alternative put forward by the state of Virginia was, was not equal even, regardless of se separate not being equal. In a case where I was an expert witness, um, it was claimed by the city of Philadelphia that offering Italian at girls high was equal to offering calculus two at the boys only central high. Uh, in a title IX case, Temple University ran into trouble because the sports director testified that they had three women assigned to a bedroom when the women's teams traveled and only two men assigned to a bedroom when men did. And when asked why, he said, well, obvious, men are bigger than women. So we did win a few, both of those two cases we won. So it, occasionally there's some comfort. Uh, Title IX was used a lot in discrimination in college sports. Required is that the participation and support of women in athletics be substantially proportionate to their presence in the student body. A case I worked on involving Brown, uh, the refusal of the Supreme Court to review a favorable decision for the plaintiff in the lower courts resulted in more or less ending that, that chain of litigation. And of course, what could be better than statistics to demonstrate substantial proportionality? Human rights now, beyond what we often lab label civil rights issues here in the United States, there are broader situations envisioned by many when we speak of human rights, the deprivation of personal security, the right to live in the world. Sometimes we neglect those at home and we talk about them a lot abroad. Violence or oppression by authoritarian regimes. We think of actions against individuals like the horrendous murder of the journalist Khashoggi by the agents of Saudi Arabia or against a class of people such as genocides through violent killing starvation or displacement, or the suppression of women by the Taliban or of minority groups elsewhere, or like Texas, where new laws deprive women of the ability to control their own bodies. Can statistics or statisticians do anything other than document the atrocities? Indeed, education and training, perhaps resettlement plans, provide the promise of better, better times. Certainly there's a role there for us. In particular, of course, the status of women improves as soon as women become significant wage earners. We've seen that happen in a number of countries. Here's the information developed by a group of scientific societies, university groups, and cleared with the White House Office of Science Advisors with whom uh, a number of organizations that I work with have been in contact. So you can look up there and see what the White House thinks that universities could be doing to help things out. They sometimes have trouble with their Zoom, however. Okay, so what can you do now? There are welcoming plans for more than 50,000 Afghani refugees, in, some of them documented in the reference I just gave you. 
governments, state and local immigrant agencies, communities are providing food, housing, school for the children, support for the necessities of life, but ultimately employment is what is needed. Useful, productive employment is required. The Afghani refugees are not asylum seekers whose foreseeable future will be their returning to their homeland. There are plans under the Institute of International Education Scholar Rescue Plan to place a handful of scientists in temporary slots provided by universities, but that will accommodate very few. There are many more among the refugee population with some scientific training who could help meet the needs that currently seem to be enormous. For instance, we can always use some more data scientists. Many of the 130 communities where resettlement, where uh, there's going to be resettlement of substantial numbers of, of refugees have universities who could, as their contribution to the relief of the refugees whose fate we have brought on, we meaning the country, uh, the, we could provide some training to a small number of students, free tuition, support, all kinds of things. Still, it would only be a few, but it would be more than zero. More than zero. And at least it would be a contribution that many of us could make or many of us could persuade our employers to make. Refugees are always with us. Refugees from Afghanistan and Haiti, uh, neither region having been a stranger to widespread human rights problems in the past. Often the treatment of refugees, uh, once they've been gathered together in refugee camps, isn't what it should be. Uh, aside from the recent reports of what happened on the Rio Grande River, uh, there have been reports of abuse elsewhere. I was involved for a while in the work of Help Age to study the treatment of the elderly among refugee camps in Jordan, Kurdistan, Pakistan, Pan Panama, Uganda, but I also think of those in Turkey, Balkans, on the coast of the English Channel in France. Um, all of these people uh, need some help of, of some sort and are not treated very well once they're in refugee camps. In the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, Founders of Statistics Without Borders, an organization that those of you who don't know about it should learn more about, a health plan for recovery there. But surely the planners, nor the people who were there, didn't anticipate the displacement of thousands with the next earthquake, the displacement from the first earthquake, and many to South America, of course, relied in, re, resulted in their being uh, ending up at the U.S. border and then being shipped back to their homeland where it was now a foreign locale to them. Uh, and of course, there are the abductions that are now occurring, not necessarily to refugees, but they certainly are huge human rights problems. Well, we, one of the things that I grew up on was demonstrating in Washington that women's rights are human rights. Education is also a human right. And much of my work in human rights has revolved around education, um, relatively calm, you might think. I found this to be the case in most of the work I've done with Amnesty International, like for example, for Roma children in the Czech Republic or with the American Middle East Education Foundation in the Middle East and North Africa. My first dealing with an individual issue involved the release of a mathematician from prison in Uruguay. It wasn't his professional work that was the cause of his imprisonment, but rather in the past he had been um, member of parliament and, and the chief secretary of the communist party. Um, we did get him out of prison. It led me to believe that things could be done by scientists to help individual scientists. Um, there have been stat statisticians who, unlike the mathematician I mentioned, have um, run into trouble because of the work they actually do. There's an ongoing case with uh, the government of Greece and, and a statistician there that we keep bringing up all the time in, in spite of the handful of trials in which the statistician has been found not guilty, he's still under threat of further action. Argentina was a case of the uh, damages that the government was trying to impose upon a woman who was reporting a cost of living that was far less, far more, sorry, far more than what the government was reporting. In Russia, there are ongoing problems. Uh, we're involved with the cases of several uh, mathematicians there. My involvement in Tunisia combined work for individuals with general efforts to improve education. A Tunisian mathematician periodically arrested as a communist or a Muslim. There was a time when we 
the US government found a communist under every bed. Um, th this mathematician managed to, between arrests, spend some time in the United States. And he worked at the University of Maryland with my husband, who was a differential geometer. Many years later, I was warmly welcomed in Tunis uh, as the mathematician had become the minister of higher education and research. What he recalled from his visit to Washington was that one night as I drove us around town, hoping to view the sunset from the steps of the Capitol, I got in the procession that was escorting President Reagan to the Hill for an address to Congress. Then I managed to maneuver us out safely without ending up in prison, was his fondest memory of his stay in the United States. Sadly, things are once again not too good in Tunisia. Another place that I helped to visit with mathematicians was Eritrea, just as it was becoming independent. I had taken a domestic flight from Addis Ababa, but when I reached Asmara, I was denied entry for lack of Eritrean visa. Fortunately, my ex-student who had invited me could see my encounter with the border official. And even more fortunately, the official was my student's student. So he uh, managed to get let us in. And the next day, I found myself in Asmara seeing the only demonstration I've ever seen in honor of International Women's Day with women driving tanks. Uh, unfortunately, also seeing a procession of um, the victim, the children who were left uh, motherless. Unfortunately, my ex-student is once again in exile from his country, and the government of Eritrea can certainly not be marked as a defender of human rights. I sometimes come to think I should stay away from educational projects abroad. Uh, Nicar Nicaragua, Myanmar, Brazil, Iraq, Palestine, all have human rights problems, uh, not brought on by my work in education. Um, but so do we, and there are, UN there are UN agencies who are investigating the more serious uh, cases, genocides and war crimes, and I and others have worked with them to incorporate the use of statistics in their work, but the task is immense, needs more statisticians. Not all ventures are a success. I went to Rwanda to select a sample of prisoners to begin the post-genocide judicial proceedings. But the problem was that the sample was random and it ended up not having the people for the first set of trials in it who were preferred by the government as the initial cases, as the first people to be, uh, to be brought to face justice. Uh, so the sample was discarded. Um, there, was also, there was another person, however, from Rwanda clamoring to be tried. As a genocide, the perpetrators of the Rwandan uh, genocide were subject to trial in an international court that was established for the purpose. And I was contacted by an accused who wanted statistical help to show that the genocide wasn't really a genocide. Uh, it's only under the uh, UN charter considered a genocide if, if the basis was race or religion or ethnicity. Um, and this man claimed that he shouldn't be charged with murder, or he shouldn't be charged with genocide he should only be charged with murder under Rwandan law. His assertion was it was really an economic crime. Uh, only rich people were killed because people wanted to get their assets. And it just happened to be that most of the rich people were Tutsis. I think every accused should be able to get statistical help as well as legal help and assistance. But this wasn't the case that I really wanted to consult on for a variety of reasons, primarily because my French was certainly not up to understanding the complexity of all the legal documents involved. I've also been involved in a long series of human rights connected events in Iraq. Between the Gulf War and the Iraq War, I was sort of clandestinely smuggled into the Kurdish part of Iraq to help develop a statistics program at the university in Erbil. Then I worked on a project to try to rebuild the educational structure demolished in the Iraq War. Uh, that was an, an interesting undertaking. Uh, obviously, there were some schools that were destroyed as part of the U.S. bombardment when Iraq was, was invaded. But the contractors were hired with the intention of, of, of repairing the schools, bringing them back into shape. Problem was that the contractors couldn't find the schools that they were supposed to repair. There was no such thing as street addresses in post-war Iraq, not that there had been street war, 
street addresses in pre-war Iraq either. So what we did was conduct a survey of Iraq, finding every uh, high school and whether or not it needed to be repaired, what its current facilities were, what its current um, the extent to which it had it still had after the war enough teachers, enough uh, infrastructure to uh, keep education running. So once we had a list, then it was turned over to somebody, of course, to try to do something about it. That's one of the problems that we all find when we work on statistics and we think we get some results. It's left to somebody else to implement them, whether it's a small thing in our own way of life or whether it's an international crisis. Uh, we also worked on voting rights in, in, in Iraq, which very difficult to judge that as a success. And finally, the uh, last one, that project that I worked on that didn't work, was to survey Kirkuk. Uh, Kirkuk is a, a town in northeastern Iraq, which was a big center during the Ottoman Empire. And as a result, it had uh, both Kurdish, uh, indigenous Kurdish people there, and a lot of people uh, with a Turkish background or a Turkmen background, which is not exactly the same. And under Saddam Hussein, a lot of Iraqis from other parts of Iraq were moved into Kirkuk in order to prevent its being too Kurdish or too Turkish. Uh, so the idea in the uh, post-Iraq war period was to try to uh, do something about an agreement as to where Kirkuk should be in the division of the various provinces around Iraq, what some of the standards should be, who should be able to um, uh, take control, so to speak. The problem with that is, as you know, one of the first things you tell people when you're teaching sampling is that you need to have a, a lack of bias. You've got lots of non-sampling errors. Uh, and the problem was we couldn't find um, surveyors who could work in a part of Kirkuk that was not their own part. If the Kurdish surveyors went to the Turkish part, uh, nobody would talk to them. In fact, they would be lucky sometimes to get away with their lives. And conversely, the Turkish um, uh, surveyors couldn't work in the Kurdish part. Uh, so that, again, as I say, not all, not all projects end up the way we hoped they would. And last but not least, a long-standing target for human rights work is the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, even the name of the destination is a matter of, bi of bitter contest. However, the fact remains uh, there's a lot that can be done. My work has been in education, in public schools, um, and in, universi in university. One night back in 1982, I was in London and needed to fly the next day to Tel Aviv, but on the plane, as I wo awoke from a nap, we appeared to be following along the path of the Nile, which is not how you normally get into Tel Aviv. Well, it turned out that there were airspace re restrictions due to the invasion of Lebanon. Now, this caused me a problem because my assignment had been to try to work out some sort of cooperative arrangements for sharing the computer facilities of the West Bank universities in case of shutdowns. My resource for equipment help from IBM in Israel was unavailable as he was off to Lebanon. However, substitutes were found and the least were mildly successful. We got better new uh, IBM equipment and the shutdowns got more frequent, but at least there was a way around them. Another time when I was working on education uh, situations in, in the West Bank, I found myself at a mathematics colloquium in Ramallah, surrounded by armed Israeli forces who arrived just as we were having the usual tea and, co tea and cookies uh, before the colloquium started. We were holding a meeting, in a, an unauthorized meeting in the, in the local YMCA because the universities were closed. And uh, eventually we negotiated the ability to stay for the colloquium and hear a great mathematics talk. Maybe it's dangerous work. Sometimes I thought so. But at any case, uh, there's a lot of work remaining, remaining to be done. Be an observer or being a participant. One can decide if one wants to work in human rights, which human rights one wants to work on. There are all kinds of, of uh, organizations. Some of them have a geographic base. Some of them have an ethic, ethnic orientation or a specific topic like health or housing or children 
Of course, not everyone makes the same choices, broader in some sense than the rights uh, or social justice as such, but many of the principles and the techniques for study are the same. Sometimes the exercise of a right one believes in does harm to the, and to the perceived rights of others. There are endless possibilities. Some of the applications of statistics rights problems are as simple as a bar chart. We use the bar chart to, bar chart to show uh, all of the no-named burials in Argentina during the, the dirty wars in Argentina. They had a lot of bodies that were buried without a name on them. And although the government asserted that the people who were missing had just taken refuge, refuge in Brazil or someplace, in fact, they were buried in the cemeteries. And you remember what Florence Nightingale managed to do with the Nightingale Rose when it comes to statistics making a change. More recently, multiple estimation techniques have proved useful in the Balkan Wars, and a challenge to Bolivian election results was based upon the application or possibly the misapplication of chain points analysis. As a lawyer, I have a pro bono obligation I would like to see statistics, statisticians have the same pro bono obligation and provide much needed help. So I leave you with that as a way to end the notion of statistics and human rights. Thank you, Mary. That was a riveting presentation. I'm sure we'll have many questions for you during the live Q&A portion of today's program. At this time, I invite you to head backstage by turning our video and microphone off. We look forward to seeing you again shortly. Before we head into our next segment, let's find out our first poll results. Let's see if you knew or could guess the name of Mary's dissertation title. Well done, everyone. The answer is a radical subcategories. Now let's test your knowledge again. The polling window will open up shortly. What is the name of the mathematician for whom Mary Gray received an NSF grant to form a day in honor of for workshops and mentoring. A. Anna Pell Wheeler. B. Amy Neudel. C. Sonia Kovalevskaya. Go ahead and make your choice. We will share the results of the second poll after our next segment. Next, we have some warm wishes from our generous sponsors. We will be hearing from Dr. Joseph Capillary from Pfizer and Dr. Ronald Wasserstein from the American Statistical Association. Following their messages will be a short break, and then we will resume around 4 or 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time with the interview portion of our program. My colleague, Dr. Yu Ping Zhang, will be your host for the remainder of the program. And we have already received some great questions 
from you for Mary. Thank you. Remember, you may submit questions at any time using the questions tab located on the main program page. We'll compile them for the interviewers to ask during the interview portion. Now let's enjoy our sponsored videos. Hello, my name is Joe Capillary. Behind me are all the books that I co-authored. <laughs> Only joking, but I did read most of them. As a proud Pfizer employee of 25 years, an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association for the past 10 years, and a privileged adjunct faculty member at the University of Connecticut for 20 years, I am most humbled and honored to offer warmest and heartiest congratulations to Professor Mary Gray for being celebrated at the 27th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium sponsored by Pfizer, ASA, and UConn. I would like to acknowledge the generous support and commitment of my wonderful Pfizer colleagues, Denise Alamayu, Dan Meyer, and Canon Netarajan for their leadership in helping to make this glorious event a reality. Recently, I had dinner with David Salzberg, who is the first statistician hired by Pfizer, its first elected fellow of the ASA, and also the first to earn a PhD in statistics from UConn. Lots of firsts. David is the original Pfizer catalyst of this Pfizer-sponsored colloquium, and he too extends joyful congratulations to Mary Gray. As we know, Mary has been an exemplary champion for gender equity, diversity, human rights, and mentorship for all people, intended for all people, and especially those who have needed it the most, in particular women and underrepresented populations. And Pfizer is proud to embrace that same laudable culture and commendable set of values and behaviors. One example from Pfizer is equity through parity. In 2019, Pfizer announced a commitment to increasing opportunity through parity, including fairness and promotions and horizontal movement across demographic groups. Since that time, minority representation, including women, Blacks and Hispanics, has increased measurably throughout the organization, including at the vice president level and higher. In June of 2021, Pfizer hired Ramses Jean-Louis to become Pfizer's chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. Mary Gray has been a de facto chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer long before this title and its significance came to the forefront. A second example is internal programs for equity. In May 2021, Pfizer launched the Breakthrough Fellowship Program and Breakthrough Research and Development, R&D, rotational program. Two first-of-their-kind educational programs designed to increase Pfizer's pipeline of diverse scientific talent. A third example is equity in the community. Since 2020, Pfizer has donated more than $2 million to communities of color suffering disproportionately from the COVID-19 pandemic and added $3 million to address specific healthcare disparities in the African-American community and in social justice reform. A fourth example is equity in clinical trials. Recently, Pfizer conducted a landmark, rigorous, comprehensive analysis to the ethnic, racial, gender, and age diversity in Pfizer-sponsored U.S. clinical trials in order to establish a baseline and to, and to evaluate Pfizer's current practices. 
Statisticians, David Grubin, David Keller, and Canon Netarajan are among the study's co-authors. Pfizer plans to use this information to better understand the impact of our medicines across diverse groups, reduce health disparities, and ensure we are best serving the needs of all patients. This research by Rodas and colleagues and Industry First is published in the April 2020 issue, 2021 issue of Contemporary Clinical Trials. In addition to those rich, timely examples and with benevolent actions commensurate with Mary's altruistic aims and ideals, Pfizer and the Pfizer Foundation provide coordinated support for disaster and humanitarian relief and recovery efforts around the world. For example, Pfizer has matched donations from me and other Pfizerites to support school construction and education in Kandel, a town in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. For the benefit of all students, and especially girls who have traditionally been denied equal access to education. That would make Mary Gray most proud. Pfizer has also fully matched my donations to the New England Statistical Society to support the next generation of students in statistics and data science, including scholarships and other opportunities for underrepresented minorities. In response to the recent earthquake in Haiti and to Hurricane Ida, Pfizer and the Pfizer Foundation have provided charitable grants and launched a global colleague disaster matching campaign in order to assist major organizations that provide support. In response to the recent conflict in Afghanistan, Pfizer has launched a program to hire and train 100 refugees by the end of 2022. In addition, Pfizer is committed to provide mentorship opportunities to an additional 150 refugees by the end of 2022. Finally, regarding human rights. Pfizer is proud to have been one of the early signatories to the human, United Nations Global Compact. The UN Global Compact, an initiative that calls on companies to align strategies and operations with universal principles on human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, and to take actions that advance societal goals. All of what Pfizer has done and will continue to do with diversity, equity, and human rights aligns nicely with Mary Gray's lifetime passion and admirable achievements in making the world a better place for all people, especially those who have been underserved or underrepresented. Mary has personified Pfizer culture in Pfizer red, white, and blue, Pfizer values in grand style. As such, Pfizer is most delighted to salute and embrace Mary as honoree and speaker at the 27th Pfizer ASA Yukon Distinguished Statistician Colloquium. Mary, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the American Statistical Association, I congratulate you on this recognition and thank you for your wonderful address. The ASA is a longtime supporter of this colloquium, and I have been personally involved for many years. I always delight in the individuals who are selected to receive this honor, but none are more personally inspiring to me than Mary Gray. I could reel off a list of contributions that Mary has made to the ASA and to the profession, as they are numerous. She has been an outstanding teacher, leader, advocate, and mentor. However, what inspires me is that Dr. Gray has invested her time, energy, and talent into issues related to scientific freedom and human rights for many, many years. It's easy to sit back and enjoy a highly successful career in academe. It's another thing to take the unique combination of legal and statistical expertise 
that she has and apply it to helping those who are being oppressed and persecuted, not only around the world, but in her own backyard. Dr. Gray stands up for workers at her, her university who do not have the rights and privileges extended to others. I'm so fortunate to have had the opportunity to visit her campus and to have worked with her on projects and especially to have seen how her wisdom is sought by others. Thank you, Mary, for your leadership, your inspiration, and your unflagging support for the profession, for the ASA, and especially for others whose rights are being denied them.
Thank you to Pfizer and ISA for their congratulations on Mary and uh, also for supporting this colloquium series. Hello all, I'm Yu Ping Zhang, a colleague of Deepak Days from the University of Connecticut Statistics Department and your host for the remainder of our program. Before we invite out Mary and our interviewers, let's check in with the results of our second poll. What is the name of the mathematician for whom Mary Gray received an NSF grant to form a day in honor of for workshops and mentoring? Good job, everyone. The correct answer is C, Soya Kovalevskaya. Remember, when lucky question asker will win a commemorative promotional item from this colloquium, we will randomly select the lucky winner from the results that pose their questions using the questions tab. Now I will step backstage to continue to monitor the questions. I invite Mary and our interview team of doctors Nancy Flonoy and Nova Shara to join us. Hi, thanks, Mary. That was wonderful. It's um, always moving not only to hear about all your personal trials and travels and, and um, things that you're involved in, but also to get the perspective that you give when you kind of lay out the timeline of how laws are passed and this and that happens. It's, um, it's always quite awesome. So uh, we have some questions. Um, let me ask you first. I recall that there were uh, there was some great female talent, mathematical talent around Berkeley at the time you were there. Tell us a little bit about that time and what it meant to have female colleagues. Well, actually, I didn't have female colleagues uh, at the time that I was at Berkeley. Uh, there were no uh, women tenured mathematicians, uh, tenure line mathematicians. The only um, tenured person that uh, I knew was um, uh, in, was a statistician, and uh, I worked with her and later was able to, to uh, publish um, some material on salary equity with her. But the uh, people who were at Berkeley were Julia Robinson, who was the first woman mathematician elected as a member of the National Academy for work on one of Hilbert's problems. Um, when it was announced that she was elected to the National Academy and the San Francisco Chronicle called up the university and said, we can't find her name in the faculty directory, who's Julia Robinson? The person in charge of programs at the University of California said, oh yeah, that's Professor Robert Robinson's wife. Um, and then there was also the wife of a, of a statistician who was fairly well known and who taught occasionally. And another statistician, another mathematician who was um, the wife of a mathematician and taught occasionally. And I got to teach in the summer because my husband was on the faculty and I couldn't teach during the regular year. So I taught at a nearby university. So there were people around, but there were no sense where they met colleagues. A few years later, women started coming as graduate students, which is always a good first step. And before I left the Bay Area, there was a huge controversy about hiring a woman in a tenure track position. One of the controversies being that she was a woman and second, she wasn't American and people were upset about the, both of them, I think equally. So Berkeley was a good place to be and there was lots of good mathematics going on there and lots of, of women who came along a little bit later, but at the time I was there, it was sort of a lonely place. Yes, well, um, Noir? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you uh, today, Dr. Gray. You've been a lifelong mentor, not just in academia, but also a life mentor to me. And I appreciate this honor of having the ability to ask you questions. Um, so you've excelled in a field that was dominated by men. 
Would you share some decisions you made that helped you along the way? Well, one of the things that I started out thinking was don't get mad, just get even. <laughs> so you, you spend your time thinking about how you're going to get even. And usually it's by trying to do something good, either for yourself or for somebody else. No point in wasting your energy getting mad. Um, the people, first of all, it's not clear they're ever going to change. And secondly, who cares? There's other stuff you can do. Thank you. So uh, I would like to congratulate you on receiving a major award from the Mathematical Association of America last July. This was for contributions to the field of mathematics and to the association. And I heard that you'd been nominated for this award decades ago, back in 1983, but that the society leadership uh, nominated by the awards committee and the society leadership refused to give you the, uh, actually give you the award. And so none was awarded at all in 1984. And you just, I guess, learned about that this last year. So you must have mixed feelings um, about what they say uh, turning, um, I saw in the newspaper clip that they called it rectifying the submission. So can you tell us um, how you think this change of heart reflects the change in times or? Well, I think a lot of credit to the executive director who, in cleaning out the basement, discovered that this was the year in which the award was not given and asked the question, why was no award given, and found out about the recommendation, which was then turned down. Um, it's sort of, you know, the reverse of pulling down the statues of Robert E. Lee or taking Fisher's name off of awards or so on. They were trying to, um, to show that people who make awards have had a change of heart. I, though, have never been told exactly who objected strongly and exactly why. It could have been simply because I was a woman and they didn't believe in women mathematicians. It could be because I'd started the Association for Women in Math and they considered it a rival. You know, it's sort of like two unions fighting one another. Uh, not a very pleasant thought, but it happens. I had done a lot of work on um, uh, involving minorities and had a, some, a few grants from a few foundations to to work on issues with HBCUs and so on. It may be that they were envious of that, although you think they would have been supportive. Uh, it may have been because I did a lot of work with Palestinians at the time, and that was one of the periods when that was not very popular, never that it ever is. Or it may be that uh, what my late husband would have said, I was just too pushy. And I'm still just too pushy, but they decided they would give me the award anyway. We're glad you are pushy. <laughs> All right. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, you've told us about the turning point in your life when you decided it was time to get a low degree and, and you did so. I, I just have to say, I'm glad you were not challenged further that you didn't understand something else in yet another field and you pursued yet another degree, <laughs> uh, given how tenacious and how pushy you are, as your husband, late husband, have said. My question to you, uh, Dr. Gray, throughout your career, do you find it easier and or more impactful to get messages and ideas through using the language of law or the language of numbers or both? And if you can give an example. Well, it's difficult because you run into too many uh, lawyers who say, the reason I'm a lawyer is because I never liked mathematics. And uh, it gets pretty hopeless. But then sometimes students can get pretty hopeless. Uh, and taught, I, in the course I taught last spring, I had a retired law professor uh, who was taking this graduate course in statistics because she never understood what the people were talking about. And now suddenly, since she was retired, she was deciding to, to learn the statistics. So it's, you know, C.P. Snow thought there were two concert cultures. He didn't think one was mathematics and one was the law, but it might as well have been. Um, it's difficult sometimes, and people speak different languages. I even feel myself putting on and taking off my law hat, my statistics hat, depending on with whom I'm speaking. Uh, lots of times I just assume people didn't know I was a lawyer because they want some free legal advice. And then occasionally they want free statistical advice. So uh, there are some people who appreciate the fact that, uh, that statistics is important. Generally, there are people will tell you if you push them into a corner, there are too many lawyers and not enough statisticians. And that's a very comforting thought. Okay. 
So um, turning to social justice, um, with regard to an individual person's uh, work to, to work in advancing social justice, how might you weigh um, working with an organization versus taking, doing statistical work with an organization versus um, taking a legal route? I think so. I didn't put that. If, if an individual is trying to decide where to put their effort in a particular case, you know, how wh you have a cause. When do you decide to try and change the organization? And when do you go to the law? I think sometimes um, laws is going to be the last resort. Uh, it depends upon how, in some sense, and how serious the problems are. As I've said, pay equity, I've always felt pay equity was an issue, but it wasn't an issue that my life depended upon. Uh, I always had enough to eat, roof over my head, etc. cetera. Um, so, so you do things to try to support organizations and, and make things work um, because you can get along with some not so good things at the same time. And that's a judgment you have to make. Uh, I, you know, I tell people don't resort to the law unless you really have, really have tried everything else, because that's often doesn't lead much of any place and there's nothing left uh, after you've lost. Whereas if you were working with an organization, uh, the organization is probably still there. And if it isn't, you can go start another one. I, um, I recently stopped being the chair of the board of an organization because I couldn't put up with some of their policies. I still work with the organization, but I can't stand the, um, the identification with some of the policies. So it's a balance. It always is. All right. Um, so Dr. Gray, innovative technologies, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, have been championed as crucial for solving humankind problems, such as poverty, and for ensuring health and well-being across the globe. How are such achievements jeopardized knowing the famous expression that you've used in your presentation, garbage in, garbage out? Noir, I didn't hear the last sentence. Uh, can we repeat the last, um, or the last, last piece of it? How are such achievements jeopardized knowing the famous expression, garbage in, garbage out, in uh, using AI and machine learning as you know, the humankind solution to solve poverty and other health and well-being issues. Well, the problem with garbage in, garbage out is there's lots of garbage in the world. And it's very difficult to distinguish it sometimes from uh, what the facts of the matter actually are. Um, and um, it's it's a day-by-day -day sort of thing. You have to put everything on the that you can find on the table and turn it over a couple of times before you go any further. Uh, you, you can't always uh, make decisions easily. Now, at, can you introduce new methods? Yeah, you can introduce new methods, but one of the things you have to ask yourself down the road is, is what's the end result of this? Um, there are people who uh, won't get involved in any kind of military work. There are people who won't get involved in any military work that involves killing people. Well, it's very difficult to see how you can be in military work not involved in killing people. Uh, you can work for an organization that generally does good things, but occasionally does something really bad. And um, it doesn't make up for the fact that they do really good. Definitely. I can go to the next question. Yes. So, um, Fake news and misinformation cause chaos and noise. In judgment, it's difficult because the world is that complicated. How do you manage? You're you're splitting out again. Uh, can okay. can can you put it or can somebody put it in chat so I can read it? So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, get almost the next one in chatter. Bill? No. I got it here. Just it's not a question of being close to something. It's a question of it, of it's being garbled. I see. Okay. Um, Nancy, you want to? You want to? I add got it. Yeah. You want me to read it? I'll read it while yeah, you. No, read no, no. I can. I can read it. Well, I meant you need to read it out loud for everybody. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, then you need to clap it, flip it back up. 
Um, did you get it, Mary? Yeah. Fake news and, mis and misinformation cause chaos and noise. Judgment is difficult because the world is. Am I to finish the sentence or is there more to it? Judgment is difficult because the world is a complex, complex place. How do you manage to make sound judgment in a world full of noise, especially when you're dealing with human rights issues? I think you need to assume that people are act, acting in the best interest of someone. Now, the question is, is the someone themselves or is the someone a, a broader collection of people? Um, and then on that basis, decide which it is that you want to put your money in or your time in. Um, the noise that comes across, actually the noise that comes across is one of the least of the problems because the louder, the louder people shout, the less likely it is they have anything to say. That's always been my, my judgment of politics, but it also is my judgment of a lot of other fields. Uh, if, you, if you have to be shouting, uh, it's probably because you don't have anything to say. So you can weed out some of that in the first place and then see what you can dig behind uh, what, what's being said. Now, considering recent developments, the political and human rights front, as such as Afghanistan, then what comes after that? Was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was reading off the chat, but the stop with that. The problem with chat is it never it never gives you all of it. Okay, well, I'm going to go with the next question. <laughs> um, so you've been active in both statistics and the mathematics communities. Can you tell us a bit how those cultures compare over time with respect to equity issues? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I used to make the judgment on the basis of, of the leadership of the two organizations. Uh, the ASA has had a number of women presidents over a period of time. Um, I've often thought that they only let the terms last a year so they can work more people in. I don't see how it's possible to be an effective president of an organization as complex as ASA in a year, but women managed to do it. Uh, so from the point of view of um, enhancing the leadership of women, I think the statistics associated that ASA has been ahead of the mass society. The mass society in its first hundred years had exactly two women as president, and that was in the last maybe 10 of the hundred years. Um, and th that term lasted longer. I don't think that had anything to do with it. I feel that mathematicians... Uh, there, there, was a, there used to be a saying in Europe that um, in England, professors think they're God. In Germany, they are God. And that, that statement came out of the community as uh, I know it in mathematics and not statistics. Uh, the problem with mathematics in some sense is that my screen went blank, but I can talk anyway. Um, mathematics is too much in academe. Uh, there aren't enough people in math society who come from government or who come from industry. There's another math mathematics organization called the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, which has more, more non-academics in it, and it's less elitist. But um, mathematicians are very elitist. The very top structure in mathematics, the, at any time, maybe the top five mathematicians in the world tend to be great people. Uh, they're modest about their own work, they're encouraging of other people, uh, they, they behave in a way that's really admirable for someone to, to be a model to younger people. But then it's the next 50 who tend to be obnoxious. And, yeah, and that's the people that you deal with mostly on a day-to-day. -day. I was mentioning being um, at the mathematics colloquium in Ramallah surrounded by the armed guards. That happened to be uh, because Israel was giving a prize to a very well-known math mathematician at the time, who'd won all sorts of prizes, but it was some, someone I knew rather well. And I had been asked uh, to manage to get him to, to Ramallah because uh, it was a problem. But in any case, he was perfectly willing, not perfectly willing, he wouldn't take the prize from the state of Israel unless he was allowed to speak in the West Bank. 
So that's the reason we had to, to arrange this. So that, as I say, sometimes the people at the top are the best. It's the next layer. It's the people whose own aspirations haven't been met. And they take it out on other people. And I, I, I found it more in mathematics than in statistics, but I didn't know statisticians well for the first 10, 15 years of my career. So I can't really make a, a judgment that way. And mathematics, as far as getting women as president, has done very well in the last half dozen years. And the Association for Women in Math has been much more um, interested in social justice causes than has the Caucus for Women in Statistics. Not to say anything against the Caucus for Women in Statistics, because it emphasizes something else. So I think the women's organizations in both cases um, have been quite similar, except that um, AWM got started earlier in the schools. Um, now the caucus is working a little bit in school programs, but not nearly as much. Um, the Association for Women in Math has been better at get out, getting outside funding, which of course is an important aspect if you're trying to do social justice because it costs money and most of the people who are working in it don't have much. Well, thanks, because asking about the societies there was my next question. So, uh, Noir? Yeah. Uh, is it better now, Mary? Can you hear me? Yes. Now? yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you, um, you, considering recent developments in the uh, political and human rights fronts, such as Afghans coming to the U.S., the prosecution of minorities in some countries, and the mistreatment of women in workplaces and discrimination against scientists in some autocratic countries, how do you think you and others were able to help using data and statistics? Well, it's a little bit at a time. Um, you know, with respect to the Afghanistani refugees, there were 60,000 of them. So I don't expect I'm going to be able to do anything for a large number, uh, nor is, is my university. But on the other hand, there are 3,000 universities in the United States. Uh, if, if each one of them decided to give a training position to an Afghanistani refugee, to train them to be something in a professional field in which there's a great need, like data science these days, um, the average size of the family among the refugees is between five and six. So if you could manage to get three people trained, uh, 30, sorry, manage to get 3,000 people trained, you would have a, a real inroads into the 60,000. There's then the training of people to do uh, non-academic things, which is, like I said, my, my father taught me how to drive a truck. That was really useful in doing human rights work, but that's not why he taught me to drive a truck. Um, you need to think about getting people in positions where they can get employment that's going to last. Uh, Uber drivers are terrific, but it's not a career. Thank you. Uh, I think we can go over um, two of uh, the questions that came from the audience that uh, fall under social justice. Um, Nancy, should I go over the first one? Sure. Um, this first question came from David Gruben at Pfizer. There is a movement among social justice advocates in academia, college and high school, that math is racist. When you encounter a person making that statement, what do you say to that person? And what should the ASA's position be? Well, that's a very timely question because we have people in my university who want to get rid of a placement exam we use to put people in the first math or stat course they take at the university. And um, you look at the statistics, and it's true that the average score on the placement exam of minority students is less than the average score of non-minority students. But instead of investing the time and the energy and the money uh, in more training programs so that the minority students are better trained and if they take a placement exam would score better, they concentrate on just putting people in any old course where they're not likely to succeed very well. I attribute it at universities, um, in businesses, I, you know, I don't have that much experience. In universities, one of the problems is most courses don't have prerequisites. I've discovered that in my years in the university. 
their people are taking junior and senior. Well, if it's a language, yeah, you don't take advanced French if you don't know French. But for the most part, I looked through just a week ago uh, whether or not a number of the courses in a number of departments had prerequisites, and they don't. So you're not expecting any preparation on the part of a student before you put them in the course, no prerequisites. That's not true in math. Math courses always have prerequisites. They're not necessarily stated, and they may be high school training rather than college training, but math is linear. And the concept of needing prerequisites and having linear progression is not understandable to people who don't do it themselves. And it doesn't matter how many times you try to explain this to them. Uh, it doesn't seem to do a lot of good. Um, one of the things is when we hear this from a dean, we ask the dean to take the placement exam himself or herself. And then they decide that maybe there is stuff that they don't know. And maybe they need to go back and pick up something that they didn't learn in 11th grade arithmetic or whatever. I don't know what the problem is long term. Yeah, it is racist. So are, for example, driving licenses. Um, it's true that minority, the pass rate for a driver's license in the state of Maryland, and I presume probably most states, the pass rate for minorities is less than that for non-minorities. But most of the kids who take a driving test in Maryland, um, I shouldn't say most, a large number uh, go through driving programs in high schools where they offer the programs, whereas a lot of the minority students don't. Uh, stick around high school long enough to take those courses, don't have other opportunities to learn. So they might not have some of the skills of learning to be a driver uh, that you would like them to have. Uh, I certainly don't want anybody to become a, a medical professional who hasn't acquired some basic skills. So I think you see the problem more in colleges and universities, anyplace else. And again, I attribute it to people lacking the understanding that Math is linear. You have to do on step one to get to step two. Great insights. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, we have another question that falls under this category as well from Garrett Frady. It seems to me that a major issue, aside from the obvious fact that some people simply do not acknowledge equal human rights for all, is the lack of awareness regarding the impact certain policies have on different groups of people. I believe statistics and all sciences in general could play a big role in portraying the devastating impacts of policies that intrinsically deprive different groups. The lack of awareness seems to be a result of people not trusting science or not believing in science, which seems to occur because of that controversial intersection of politics and science. How can we avoid politics overshadowing sciences so that sciences are used to help politics rather than a point of argument? Well, it's again, it's a long-term sort of thing. Uh, from time to time, we get um, an announcement in government that we're going to have evidence-based policies. The evidence-based policies are not always based upon evidence. Um, there are people working in um, in the statistical field who um, are not interested in equity. You know, I don't want to bring up Fisher again because there are a lot of people who, who have similar points of view. They're a great deal more quiet about it than he was. But in almost every case, if you have a policy, you can see that it might have an adverse impact. Um, certainly the case of the Virginia ID laws, uh, the requirement that you have an ID that consists of a driver's license or a birth certificate or a passport well, immediately you can see, it takes no, no great knowledge of statistics to see that that's going to have an impact. Then you go out and gather the data and shows, yeah, it has an impact. And does it matter whether you can drive or not, if you're going to vote for, um, for your local representative? If your birth certificate was issued so long ago that birth certificates weren't common, should that keep you from voting? Uh, so that's the announcement of that policy. Um, the issue of the minimum wage, the, the recent work in the Nobel Prize winner in minimum wage is going to be very helpful because you always hear, you don't always hear, but you frequently hear people claim that raising the minimum wage is going to have an adverse impact on uh, wages in general. Well, it turns out not to be true if you do any kind of comparative study. So it's up anytime anybody comes up with an idea, uh, it's good to try to find out what in fact is the effect going to be down the road. Um, we, we look at various sorts of things. I have a student doing, students doing a project now, which has to do with um, 
what makes a, a park space useful in a community? Um, you know, is it the amount of green space? Is it whether it has a basketball hoop for the kids? Is it whether it has picnic tables for the adults? What makes it judged more successful by the community? Well, it turns out that it's probably going to be the distance to a metro stop. But you're not going to know that unless you do some statistics. And the project's not done yet, but at least that's a hypothesis that they have. And um, they thought it up from some stuff they had read about what they knew about the parks in DC. So it's a policy that you can at least have some tests. Not, not doesn't necessarily prove it, but it at least has some tests. The fact that, that the Metro doesn't run in DC, which those of you who know DC will know, half of it is out at the moment. That has a heavy impact on the minority community, but it has an impact everybody. Why don't they fix the Metro? So what are we gonna do? Thank you. Yeah, well, you need more statisticians, you know, look around. I don't know how other people teach advanced statistics to undergraduates or statistics to graduate students, but I always give them projects and ask them to go out and look and see what policy there is around and what impact it might have on different kinds of people, what could possibilities are for improvement, what would it cost to make things better. And they're little projects, they're usually either the community of Washington and Northern Virginia, or they're back home where the students came from, but encouraging the students to get used to looking at stuff that, that has an impact on social justice, a lot of them will continue to do so. I mean, I admit a lot of them won't, but at least it's a start. So while you're giving advice, um, what do you have to say to the lone female or other minority person in an organization or organizational group like the lone statistician or, or the lone female statistician, the lone minority statistician? Uh, um, yeah, hang in there. Uh, you, need to look, you need to look for outreach. You need to go to meetings. Um, I mean, okay, pandemic's been around for, for the last year and a half, but we all hope it's going to get better. And you can't make friends very well in that kind of isolated position if you're relying on Zoom. But on the other hand, if you go to a meeting, uh, if it's an, a broad enough meeting, it's bound to have somebody else that's in a similar situation. And if it isn't, you just need to go up to the group who's standing and talking there and insert yourself into the group. You know, listen for a while, see what they're talking about, and see if you can manage to, uh, to join the conversation. Sometimes you'll be able to, sometimes you won't. But you have to, you have to make the effort, and it's a lot of effort um, just to get associated. That's one reason why so many women mathematicians do applied math is because they've sought refuge in other departments. I mean, people to talk to, and they found somebody in some other field, and they can work with them. Same thing is true in statistics. You see a lot of women working in applied fields where they have built bridges to people in, um, in other kinds of disciplines uh, because they are the lone statistician, but they're not the lone person who's interested in statistics and they're not the lone person who's interested in social justice if they wanna do something to make things better. That's a great building bridges like that. So uh, if we don't have any more questions, this will be the last question. And um, I wanted to ask you about the advice that you could give to statisticians from being, you know, from caring to doing. Uh, what, can, what can get them doing? We know they care, but how do we get them to do things? Well, the next time they find something annoying, they should ask what, what's behind that. And is there anything I could possibly do to fix it? Um, as I say, in, if you're in any large organization where you outsource some of the employees, that's a good place to start. There may be problems that they're having and they don't have any voice in the organization as a whole. And it's some place where you can step in. Um, you need to you know, find a little crack and then force it open. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't always work as well as you'd like it to but at least it's a place to start. I see we have another comment in the chat, uh, which says it's a comment, not a question. So let me read it. Um, I rec this is from uh, Mark uh, Bernison, um, Professor Emeritus at Baruch College, CUNY. Um, 
and Professor Emeritus from Montclair State University. And he recalls the meeting, meeting recalls meeting you around 1990 when I served on an ASA committee on the on scientific freedom and human rights, chaired by my late friend Yukon's Herb. Herbstam, yes, of course. I recall well, in a yeah, mm -hmm. I recall an inaugural meeting with Ms. J. Roan of Human Rights Watch with the intention of helping establish statistical support for redeveloping a population listing, quote unquote, using capture recapture methods of those killed in the then alleged genocide perpetuated by Saddam Hussein in the Anfal, Anfal um against kurdish populations hearing your talk today outlining your numerous accomplishments on the behalf of humanity confirms my long-held belief that statisticians have the opportunity to do much to help make this world a better place through promotion of human rights and social justice i wish to say thank you for all you have done and continue to say and i think we all add our yeah Agreement. Thank you very much. Great. Herb was an inspiration to us all. So I think we, um, I think we go backstage. I think that's it. Oh, Yo Ping's coming back. No, I think we're finished. Uh, I think Yu Ping will close this session. Uh, we'll just wait for a little bit. Oh, there she is. Thank you. Thank you to oh. our interviewers and the audience for the thoughtful questions. I would like to now recognize the organizing committee, my colleague Deepak Day, Han Bar, Yao Zheng, administrative staff, Tracy Berg, Courtney Trisco, and Juliet Capacis for their dedication in seeing this colloquium coming to come to fruition. Also, thanks to our dedicated steering committee members, Kanan, Natarajan, Demisi and Mihayo, Dan Meyer, Ron Wasserston, Nancy Flonoy, Deepak Day, Joseph Gala, <coughs> and Minghui Chen. Mary, on behalf of our sponsors and our guests, we would like to thank you for such inspirational remarks. To honor your participation in this event, we have presented you with a plaque in recognition of your exceptional contributions to our field. Mary, would you like to see a few words? Yes, I would. I have a nice um, plaque here, which I'm holding in front of the camera. I thank for the sponsors of Pfizer ASA and University of Connecticut for it, as well as for inviting me. It's always a great opportunity to, um, to have a platform where you can express your views. I hope that a lot of people will be inspired to do some things for human rights and social justice. Uh, it was a good experience for me. It was great to be back with Nancy, who was extremely helpful for me, to me along the way. And it's always good. Um, Noir has been a, a substantial support uh, in more recent years. So it was a good, good production. You people at the University of Connecticut are great. Unfortunately, we have to do everything virtually, but the next time I pass through Connecticut, perhaps I can say hello. Thank you, Mary. As a reminder, the recording of today's program will be available in approximately 24 hours. We will send you an email with viewing instructions. Thank you once again to our sponsors, Pfizer, ASA, and Yukon, for making this event possible. Thank you all for attending. Hope to see you next time, and be well.